Amy. I'm Sarah Petters. I'm a new uh, research faculty here at, at University of Riverside, California. Hello, my name is Fidelia Lopez. I'm currently a fourth year chemical engineering student doing undergrad research with Professor Sarah Petters. Well, hi, it's great to join you today. Um, so I'm Amy Sullivan and I'm the current uh, vice president of AAAR. And I'm I also a research scientist uh, here at Colorado State University. Well, we're here to ask you a few questions. Um, so the first one, you have been very effective as an active member of various AAAR committees. And this year you are entering the role of president as we've just heard, which is the third year of the vice president to president sequence. What additions to the conference program or the changes to the organization are exciting right now? Yeah, so um, I'm really looking forward to us going to Albuquerque this year. So that's actually a new venue for us. We haven't been to New Mexico since our fourth annual um, conference. And so when we got originally got the contract for Albuquerque back in 2019, we were so excited to get to go. And then, of course, we had to postpone it in 2021. So it's really nice that we're actually going to get to go. And so because of that, we're going to take advantage of some new local things. Um, so there is going to be a trip to the Nuclear Museum during the conference, um, as well as Sandia National Labs and Los Alamos National Labs will also be presenting there to tell a little bit about the history of aerosol science in the area. Um, also, um, it's exciting that the past few years we've been able to use the president's funds um, as part of our conference. So this fund started in 2016. And uh, so back in 2022, Leah Williams used it to initiate the new mentoring program that AAAR has. And then last year, Faye McNeil used it to um, invite uh, to continue with our science communication, which had become so prominent, of course, during the pandemic, and invited Andy Rebkin to do a tutorial and also um, to be part of an evening program. And so this year, I'm going to um, invite local students uh, to come and join us for the first day of tutorials, um, which is really exciting to kind of help engage the aerosol community down there. Um, and also, I think the tutorials are just something that's very unique to our conference, and so being able to have part of that outreach. Um, in terms of things that are new happening in AAAR, I'm very excited that we launched our new membership directory. So back in January, BMX was officially launched. And so now there's actually a way, a searchable database so that you can find all the members, what working group there are, committees that they're on. Um, and we have a second part that's going to be rolling out soon for all of the committees to use for organizing their meetings. And um, this was a long time coming. We're actually next in line to get it in uh, following 2018 conference when we hosted the IAC. Um, and so that is finally here and in place. And we've been able to connect it with registration this year, um, as well as a number of other things that's made it a lot seamless on the um, backside to keep our organization going. There's a lot to be said for seamless back. back <laughs> You have been involved in over 35 field campaigns focused on atmospheric chemistry measurement. Since field campaigns are pretty challenging, I want to ask, what have been your biggest campaign success stories? Sure. Um, yeah, so doing field campaigns is one of my favorite parts um, when you actually like you build an instrument and then you actually get to go and deploy it. And sometimes you get some really beautiful locations you get to work at. But it is true. They're very challenging environments, um, you know, just combined from being places with little power connectivity or being into really small spaces. Um, but I think there's a couple that really stand out for me. So probably it would be when um, in graduate school, when I was at the St. Louis super site, and that was really the first um, big deployment of the Pills Water Soluble Organic Carbon um, technique that I had been working on. Um, and so when we successfully um, deployed it and got measurements there and were part of um, the whole team for over a year, and that led to my first, first author paper. Um, and we actually even got a GRL highlight um, for it. So it was just really exciting to have it all like um, come together. And I think then, um, probably the next one that I, comes to mind is in uh, 2011, um, Sonia Kreinweiss and Bob Yolkelson had a project where they were putting instruments onto a uh, twin otter aircraft with the Forest Service to go and sample prescribed burning. 
And it just happened that they had a little bit of extra room on the plane. And so they were asked me if they thought it was possible that we could try to do something with making a real-time measurement of smoke markers. And so I got the opportunity then to try to this level Goosen uh, technique that I had been working on um, to be able to couple it with a pills and to successfully deploy it. And that subsequently led for me getting to participate then in um, the winter campaign on the C-130, uh, the ACE ENA campaign on the DOE G-1, uh, the weekend campaign on the C-130, and most recently the um, Aroma campaign on the NASA DC-8. Uh, very lucky to get on the, all those campaigns after seeing your results from the first one. Yes, and the fact that I've also now gotten to be on so many different aircraft. So I've gone from the smallest possible aircraft, <laughs> the King Air, where I can't even stand up, <laughs> and I'm only 5'1", to the largest aircraft, <laughs> the NASA DC-8, where you can like totally walk around your entire rack. That, that's the part I don't envy, but... <laughs> <laughs> All right, so next question. You've taken many roles in both your research and in the administrative service at AAAR. What habits and experiences would you say best prepared you to handle the biggest challenges that you face as you grow your career? Um, so I think that actually just part of what's being inherent to being a research scientist um, has really helped. So when you're a research scientist, you're often across many, many different projects that are all at different points. Um, so, you know, there's some that I have that are my own projects. There's some where I'm running a particular measurement that's part of the whole team, or there's somewhere I'm just an extra set of hands. Um, and so, but they're all usually all happening in sync and at different times. And sometimes you're deployed, sometimes you're in the fields, sometimes you're waiting to receive samples. And so how you kind of figure out how to um, take care of all of that. So, you know, it's like, okay, well, if I start that instrument, I can have that one running. Well, then I can go and extract these filters. And then we can have that ready to go while we start to plan for deploying that instrument, um, which, of course, we may or may not even have all the parts yet that we're in the process of building. And so I think it's um, really, you know, figuring, understanding where you um, can best use your time <laughs> and how to divide and uh, conquer for um, some of those things that really helps uh, for planning that out. Um, and I think also the other part is that, you know, when you're a research scientist, you're also uh, generally a resource um, for the group. So, you know, you're often the one who has continuously seen projects grow, um, go on. And so that you're here to um, help to keep those going, but also to develop new things. And also, you know, for the students to come and make sure that they know that you're always there to help and answer questions. Um, and so I, I think that that's also um, just kind of another part of it is making sure that people um, know that, you know, you're always there happy to help um, and, and, you know, either uh, to do it together or, you know, to, to just give advice. Do you, do you use like spreadsheets or is it in a software? <laughs> Uh, it, it, it depends a little bit uh, on, on what we're doing. Um, I do have a beautiful stack of lab notebooks. Um, I, I always say they're for my biographer. Uh, <laughs> so I, I'm i just always using one lab notebook at a time, even though I'm working on multiple projects. Uh, but I can generally remember around when I did things, maybe not specifically, like I know it might be linked to this project, but not specifically like, you know, it was, oh, definitely it was ha this happened in October or something like that. Um, and so that also really helps is that making sure that you're keeping um notes <laughs> because then sometimes you're like oh i remember that totally happened on that instrument uh let's go back and check that last time that we were like running this um i also find that to be very very helpful um especially when you have uh, multiple instruments and uh projects going on <laughs> you mean like physical yeah yeah physical notebooks i'm old school i like to write things <laughs> i like i prefer to doodle <laughs> amy is a pre-covid <laughs> <laughs> <Here's the next. laughs> uh, you recently chaired the AAAR annual conference. Can you tell us a little about your favorite part of the process? Yeah, so I uh, have to tell you that I never thought um, that I would ever be have been the chair of the conference when I attended my first conference in 2003. Um, and so it was really, it was one of the highlights um, for me. And 
there were really a lot of things I really loved about the whole process, but probably the thing that stands out the most is getting to work with everyone. So, you know, AAAR is the side where we all love aerosols. Um, and, you know, we, and there's, we all come, it's for most of us, it's our favorite conference every year, the one we look forward to <laughs> the most. Um, and you know, there's all these amazing people there, but you don't always get to meet all of them just because, you know, we have six parallel sessions happening at the same time, um, or, you know, just because of the particular sections that you might decide to go to. And so uh, when being conference chair, um, you really get to work with all of these amazing people um, all together and to be able to come together and create something um, that hopefully has made a, a, um, some impressions um, and created some new um in, um, exciting opportunities for other people. So, you know, and you get a whole mix of things because you have like working with the working groups and the special symposium organizers for, you know, really the technical content. Um, and then of course you have like working with the education committee and early career committee to create student opportunities with um, travel grants and programming. Um, and so you really get this like full breadth of, of creating that. And, you know, I think about the first time that I went to a AAAR conference. And so if there, if in any way we created a new opportunity or got someone just that much more excited about aerosol science, then, you know, that's like, I, I just, it, it's, it's really wonderful to think that that could have even happened. I should follow up. What are the opportunities for undergraduates? <laughs> um, yeah. So um, we um, often have a, um, especially uh, wherever we're hosting, we often invite um, undergraduates to come and visit for a day and they shadow um, some of the fellow graduate students um, so that they get to then participate in going to a plenary session, um, to the uh, technical sessions, a poster session. Um, we also um, highly encourage, you know, if you have done summer research to come and present a poster. Um, and then um, undergraduates are also welcome to sign up to be student assistants, which I also think is a great way to get to uh, meet people because you're helping to um, run the sessions. And you also get to take part in the tutorials. <laughs> awesome, I'll have to look into that. <laughs> okay, during your PhD at Georgia Tech, what was the major motivation behind the rush to generate a method to capture particles into liquid assays? which has been one of the defining techniques of your career. Yeah, so um, I um, joined uh, Rodney Weber's group in 2000. And um, the first deployment of the pills was actually in 1999 at the Atlanta Supersite. And so that was actually a very exciting time for aerosol science because there was many people developing new um, aerosol instrumentation. And um, that was actually the not only the first deployment of the pills, but also the first deployment of the AMS. Um, and there was also a number of new measurement techniques um, from some other um, big names at AAA you think of, like Suzanne Herring and Kim Frather. Um, and so uh, the motivation for it was to have something that was could efficiently collect um, particles that was at a high flow rate. And then additionally, the reason to put it into a liquid sample was so that then you had the ability to take that liquid sample and hopefully try a number of analytical techniques so that you could expand on what you look at the composition of the aerosol. Um, and then with those analytical techniques, those could be ones that you know you could have calibrations for so that you could be truly quantitative um, in figuring out um, the different species um, that make up the uh, aerosol. I've used it myself. <laughs> Thank you. The next one. How did you navigate the transition to being the lead on your projects? And what would you say surprised you the most about that role? Sure. Um, yeah, so I have um, a mixture of different projects um, that I lead. So I have um, some smaller ones where I have people who send me um, filter samples from right all over the world, um, different field campaigns or projects they've had um, in the lab generating aerosols um, to analyze. Um, and so for those, you know, it's very, um, it's very clear, right? You get the samples, figure out how, what they want analyzed, how to best analyze them. Um, then for bigger projects where there's actually like logistics planning for the field studies, 
Um, and, you know, it's a little bit different for me because the fact that I do also go out into the field. So I not only am helping to um, plan it, but then I actually go out and, and run the measurements and collect the data. So um, I think that the thing is always figuring out how to best uh, navigate um, what part you need to be um, working on. Um, so luckily, uh, I, my schedule is a little bit more flexible because with being a research scientist, I don't have any teaching requirements. So it really allows me to um, be in the lab or the field. Um, and so from there, that's really um, advantageous for something like this. Um, but you definitely do, you know, when you're like, okay, well, I also have to be the person who attends the meetings for the planning of it, as well as I don't just get to sit there by the instrument all the time. Um, and then of course, when we go out into the field that uh, I'm not only like making sure that um, we're all set up in the field, but that we're also collecting um, that I also have an instrument that I'm, um, you know, in charge of and deploying. Um, so it's definitely one of those things where you um, figure out how you can, um, where you're best to use your time, but there is definitely um, uh, challenges that you still never expect when <laughs> <laughs> you do things like that just because of the nature of uh, field work when it'll be like, oh, yeah, it turns out that, yep, no, there's actually no power here. And, and, how, you, and how you navigate that. <laughs> or it rains or something. <laughs> I see. I see instruments. All right. I think this one is mine. So this is the second to last question. What are you known for and what is your primary technique? of a low ball. <laughs> <laughs> so I think probably overarching, I would say it's um, aerosol composition measurements. Um, and I think it depends when you kind of met me, what you might think I'm um, most um, known for. So um, probably early on in um, graduate school, it would be for um, doing um, water soluble organic carbon. Um, when I uh, transitioned to a postdoc and beginning my research scientist, um, it was really uh, developing new ion chromatography techniques. Um, and so that's where um, I developed the levagluxin technique, um, as well as I've expanded capabilities to be able to measure um, organic acids and amines, um, even from really low concentration samples um, that are low flow rate from super clean, <laughs> Um, places like Rocky Mountain National Park. Um, and uh, I generally have about seven ICs up and running in the lab all the time. <laughs> and um, probably more recently, um, I would say it's for um, my pills um, aircraft um, measurements um, that um, I've been doing. I remember that about you having seven <laughs> ICs. A lot of ICs. I do. I have a lot. I, I have a whole, <laughs> almost every bench in the lab. <laughs> How did you get involved in aerosol science? Yeah, so um, I did my undergrad at Boston College in chemistry, and I got really lucky, and I was working in a physical chemistry lab in Dr. David Fadden's lab, um, and I, I was actually worked in that lab for three and a half years. And um, so when I, I knew I wanted to go to graduate school and everything that interested me was um, physical analytical chemistry, um, kind of with an environment looking at environmental um, work. And so um, when I was looking at various graduate programs, um, Dr. McFadden, um, who our lab was next to um, Dr. Paul Davidovitz's lab, and he mentioned that um, uh, Paul, had said uh, Georgia Tech had a really great program. Um, and so that's one that I looked into and that's when then I met Rodney Weber. And, um, and when I decided to go there, he invited me to come to um, work for the summer before I officially started as a student. And um, that's when I first, of course, started working with aerosols. And uh, pretty much I would say that I was hooked before even the end of that first week. <laughs> we were um, putting instrumentation ready to um, deploy ultimately for at the end of the summer to go to the Houston super site in 2000. And uh, so it was going into a trailer 
And then we were going to make, we made measurements at three different sites in Georgia leading up to then the trailer going to, um, to Houston. And then um, when uh, later in the fall, uh, Rodney was like, yeah, so I've been thinking about, we should try to start to figure a way to use the pills to make organic carbon measurements. Um, and that's what you'll be working on. And so then the rest is kind of history. <laughs> Um, from there. And then I um, attended my first AAAR conference in 2003 um, when I presented a late breaking poster on uh, my pills WSSC work. <laughs> I love those late breaking posters. <laughs> exactly. 